Hello and welcome to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Annual Summit 2020. I'm Harry and I'm part of the learning team here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. In this session, we're going to be reflecting on our recent webinar series for teenagers ran from uh, May to July during the height of the global pandemic. And joining us to chat about their experiences are three of our participants. We have Caitlin, Jack and Vina. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. So thank you very much for joining us for this session. It would be great to find out a little bit more about yourselves and what, uh, what enticed you to join these webinars. So Caitlin, could we start with you please? Um, hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, I was born in Hong Kong and I've lived here all my life, but my parents are both from the US. Um, I'm 12 and I just graduated from a local primary school. Um, I learned about these webinars. Um, my mom learned about these webinars from a colleague of hers whose son was also joining. And I thought it'd be interesting because school was canceled due to the pandemic and I was stuck at home and looking for exciting things to do. Hi everyone, my name's Jack. I'm 18 and I'm from Scotland. So I got involved in the webinars through my school's um, climate champions group, which had a number of other participants from Scotland joining as well. Hi everyone, I'm from India, not India to be specific. And I just finished high school this year and, and I'm going to start college in a few weeks. And I got to know about this webinar. I was just randomly scrolling to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation because um, while I was doing one of my research projects on uh, waste to energy technologies and economic viability of them, I came across this page of Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy and Incineration, which I found really interesting. So I dig that deeper and deeper. And that's how I came to follow the Ellen MacArthur Foundation regularly. So I was just scrolling to the website one day and I came across the notice. The thing that I probably learned the most from the webinars and that I think there needs to be a awareness raised about it is that it's not always to do with the product and the outcome. It's to do with the process and how it's made. Yeah. So it's, it's reducing the use of energy, the use of virgin materials during that process. So I'm going to put yeah. you on the spot a little bit now. Um, so, so Jack, you said uh, before that you, you thought it was just about recycling. And, and Vina, yeah. you, you, you shared that, that thought. Um, how would you very briefly describe what a circular economy is? Well, I would say that it's moving towards an economy that instead of mimicking history, mimics nature. Since without human interference, nature has ways of putting everything to use. Um, and it's a cycle. Um, whereas with human interference, we've taken things and we are not putting them to their fullest use and it's it's more a matter of efficiency than of longevity so a circular economy would be moving more towards longevity but if i were to add something i might add that the circular economy when you compare it to the kind of economies that we have currently worldwide uh the circular economy, changing to the circular economy might would require a whole system-wide change rather than when you go for recycling or reusing products. So if, if I were to explain what a circular economy is to my friend, I would explain it with reference to the, the, these techniques that we've already had for the past three decades, like to use, reduce, and recycle. So compared to these three, a circular economy fo um, focuses on the root of the problem. It changes the whole system. If, re if recycling and reuse are solutions to the linear economy, circular economy reduces the need to recycle and reuse by completely changing the system in the first place. 
Thank you very much, Fina. That, that is a, a brilliant elaboration and um, that's very, very insightful. Thank you. So um, let's, let's hear a little bit more about each of your experiences of, of the webinars. So I take it you were, you were probably all at home. It was the, the middle of lockdown, school was off. Uh, so, so Caitlin, could you could tell us a little bit about your your overall experience and which topics really stood out for you? Because we, we covered quite a lot in seven weeks. Um, I really like the parts about packaging because I yeah, it's really amazing how much like garbage is actually just packaging. Because if you look around at our grocery stores in Hong Kong everything is wrapped in plastic, all the fruit, all the vegetables, they're all individually wrapped. And the circular economy can actually probably really change that. Uh, which, which of the challenges that we set was the most interesting for you? Well, I really enjoyed all of them, but like the Timo one was pretty cool because we got a designer on t-shirts. And um, yeah, they were all really fun to do and you really had to think about them. I like the one where you had to redesign um, a place that's wasted by cars. So I redesigned a car park. Um, so one day when I was riding home from school on my bike, um, I just stopped by a car park and stood there and thought for a bit. And I was like, there's so many electric cars now. Wouldn't it be better if, we, like, if the car parks were um, solar? Like if all the floors had solar panels and you could, there was charging places in the car parks. I thought as a whole, the webinars were amazing and having left school and not really had much to do, um, I was definitely grasping for something and um, having the webinars, well, not only as an incentive to wake up, but to actually learn something um, was incredibly helpful. The topics I enjoyed the most, um, the cities section really stood out to me since it showed um, you know, just how innovative people around the world are getting and how we could move towards not only a more environmentally friendly world, but um, quite frankly, a more interesting world as well. Um, and as far as the challenges go, um, like Caitlin, I agree that the T-Mill um, challenge was of particular interest. I'm still operating my T-Mill store today. Um, are, are you selling? However, your, are you I, selling your clothing? Um, yes. So I've had a few sales already. Um, however, I'm still like operating social medias and trying to um, get it up as kind of like a little hobby during lockdown as well. Um, hey, I however, would I like a link to your T-Mill show. I will try and get one to you as soon as possible. There you go. You've got another customer. Fantastic. Well, um, that's great to hear that it's actually led to, to a, a potential business opportunity for you, a creative side indeed. project. I, I think you're not alone. I think there are some of the other participants have also decided to carry on with their, their T-Mill stores. I really enjoyed was the one where we had to think about a way to make a chocolate bar circular as well. So that really got me thinking about, um, okay, so there's a number of issues here. It's, it's gonna melt in transport. Um, there's only so much chocolate someone could eat at once. Or do you really buy chocolate in bulk? Um, so having to think of ways to fix that. And so what I eventually landed on was um, trying to convince people to buy it in bulk with like a reusable tin that you could fill from a counter similar to like a fishmonger's in a shop. Um, so if you pay like a deposit on the tin and then get a discount every time you use the tin um, and eliminate plastic packaging from it entirely. And if someone say just wants an individual chocolate bar, have tins in different sizes. So maybe one that will only fit um, one chocolate bar or two chocolate bars. Um, I thought if there had been a culture change that could have worked quite well. Vina, let's hear a little bit about your personal experiences and the topics and the challenges that you enjoyed the most. As far as 
the challenges go, I think my favorite one would be um, the one in which we had to figure out the most, the plastic challenge. The one when we, in which we had to figure out the most wasteful plastic and figure out the most circular product alternative to it. Rather than the process of coming up with a solution to that, I felt really proud of my solution because the the product that I chose was a toothpaste uh, tube. And because of the extent to which the toothpaste tube is so common and everybody uses it, and yet it remains one of uh, one of the most uh, wasteful products that come out of the household after you use it, the country use it again. So the the process through which I, that I went to find that solution, I really enjoyed that. And my my favorite webinars would be on the food and the cities because they gave the most unique and unthinkable solutions uh, for um, a better world. I didn't even think of uh, making the built environment sustainable and how could that happen or the solutions that were presented to us in making food systems more sustainable. So that was really interesting. So with the webinar challenges, um, the variety offered not only um, helped the webinar participants, or at least me, to be creative, but it's also encouraged me to develop a bit of a new skill set. So, for example, with the um, the chocolate bar challenge that I was talking about, um, I decided to push myself and actually try and edit a video together with some stock images, a uh, voiceover and such which was something I hadn't really done before. Whenever I'd filmed something, it was always just one take on my phone, done. Um, so this actually got me working on a bit of a bigger project for that challenge. And so um, giving me an insight into a new process, which I'd never really considered before. And now I would be more confident if I were to do that sort of thing again. So Vina. What has been your key insight, the, the one thing that you've really taken away from this webinar series? I, I, the key insight would be that, unlike before when I joined the webinar, I realized that the circular economy and changing to the circular economy is not just in the hands of a government, or businesses or organizations that work on the transition to the circular economy, but I have that power too. I can I can contribute to that transition in my own small way. And because of that, ever since I've ever since the webinar has finished, I've been looking at ways in which I can incorporate uh knowing more about the circular economy in my college courses. And also I've been entertaining this idea of how I can make my peers in college also aware of this concept, how I can start the conversation in my own college on the circular economy. So I've, I feel kind of more motivated that that I can move to the, to a circular economy in my own small way and not just leave it to the government to policy make. Well, my key insight has very much been the same as Vina's in that no one is kind of too small to make a difference. Everyone can contribute in their own way. And that even raising awareness about the circular economy, kind of taking the issues that we know are important, but might be um, inaccessible, might be the word there, um, because of how scientific it is. Um, and just being able to bring people into that conversation um, and eventually reach the innovators in our society that will be able to 
use more technical and more creative knowledge to um, really make that change. And if we highlight, you know, that there is a market there and um, there, this is going to be the future. And if we can adapt early, then we can make a much better world for ourselves. Um, and like I said earlier, a more interesting world for ourselves as well. Um, so in my own life, um, I volunteer with an organization called the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, and we recently held a event that was all about environmental protection as part of a campaign that we're running. So I was able to put um, the organizers in touch with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and we were able to broadcast an episode of the Circular Economy show all about um, the circular economy in relation to climate change to a group of teenagers all across Scotland um, with, who all found it very beneficial. And so then they will take the knowledge forward and start those conversations. So the cycle keeps continuing and eventually we will, as I said, reach those innovators. And Jack, in your, in your own life, you, uh, you volunteer for the Scottish Youth Parliament. So you're, you have an interest in politics, I take it. Are you, are you looking to contribute towards a circular economy in some way, perhaps at the, at the political level? Uh, what, what are your plans? Well, hmm. I think the best way is simply to, to campaign and raise awareness of the issue. Making environmental protection a political issue, a party political issue, is not the way forward because then it becomes a debate and it shouldn't be a debate. Um, we need to move towards a circular economy and we need to protect our environment. We need to reduce pollution. We need to make our planet livable and go beyond the 11 years that we've been given to do something about it. So the best way forward is just to push for unity on this. Most nations across the world at this point, I believe, have declared a climate emergency and it's time we started acting on it. Um, well, after taking, after taking part in the webinar, what now um, every day I, everything I do makes me think of the circular economy, like walking down the street and seeing parking lots or seeing cars, eating a chocolate bar and seeing the packaging. I think everything has to do with the circular economy and um, I feel like this webinar has really made me like actually think like everything we do, we should do it to help the environment instead of hurting it. So that's really interesting. So it's in a way it's kind of opened your eyes to, to looking at the world a bit differently and identifying things that could be improved, things that need to change. Exactly. systems or products that could be much better. So in order to get more people involved in the circular economy, um, the best way would be through some form of incentive, I feel. So for example, um, incentive could be done through either re being rewarded for taking part in the circular economy or punished in a sense for not doing so. So for example, um, if you were um, contributing to the circular economy through how you manage your waste, for example, um, the government could subsidize part of your waste management costs, um, whereas they might not do so if you're not contributing to the circular economy. Um, and since there could be higher costs associated with, um, or well, higher costs to the business um, who might be trying to use circular systems. And it would be important for there to be some form of intervention, I feel. Um, I think we need to let everybody know about the circular economy 
because the more people that know about it, the more people that will, will want to help and like solve the problems, solve the everyday problems. Um, so I think the best way to do it is like through education. Like you need to get kids, um, you need to teach kids about it as a, at a young age so that they'll grow up helping. I would agree with both Jack and Caitlin because uh, we need both incentives and education. To start with, in the beginning, we might need incentives maybe to get people to at least enter or just explore the circular economy in the first place. But then, if people aren't inherently interested or motivated to contribute to the circular economy, then uh, incentives might not be as effective as they were meant to. So, so in that, so to counter that, we also need education and making people more aware and making them more, maybe ma making them more, uh, maybe convincing them that the circular economy is the way forward and that we do need it. So I think the, the double benefit of educating people is that they'll be motivated to contribute in the first place, so you won't need as many incentives to make them join it. And the other one is that where governments do come up with policies for circular economy, they'll be readily accepted. And it is also true that politicians, policymakers focus on issues that, are, that their electorate want them to. So if the people demand it, if the people think that the circular economy is needed in the country, in the, in the region, then I think the politicians would, the government would take it up. It would come up with a framework of transitioning to the circular economy. And that framework wouldn't be limited to that particular government. It would go on beyond several government because the people wanted it is not what the government's agenda was. That brings us to the end of our session on the Circular Economy webinar series for teenagers. We've spoken to three brilliant young minds who are really wanting to make a difference and have really enjoyed their experience. It's great to hear from them. We hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions at this year's summit. So what's the solution to change the scenario? Well, the best solution is to change our system, go from the traditional linear economy to a revolutionary one called the circular economy. The purpose of this system is to keep products and material at their highest utility and value, eliminating waste. The focus is no longer consumption, but product functionality. Many benefits come from the circular economy, such as reducing the pressure on the environment due to recycling and decreasing of the resources exploitation, and innovation stimulation due to the fact that the companies have to keep looking for new ways to make a product without impacting the planet as well as boosting the economy. Now it's the time. Make a change change the system. Thoughtful Take is about being aware of the planet and using its limited resources accordingly. For this, we need sustainable action, open discussion, and environment education. We need to use our advanced technologies, which previously weren't available, to be conscious of the manner in which and the amount of resources we use so that future generations don't suffer. Now, what exactly is measured make? Instead of society weighing the importance of economy and environment against each other, we need to understand that they're connected and control rampant consumerism and address the carbon footprint. As for wise waste, we need to understand that a lot of our trash still has worth, albeit in different ways. It could be generating biogas from agricultural refuse, 
or using salvageable metal from discarded electronic appliances, even tearing up old clothes to use as dusting cloths. We need to recycle and reuse items we otherwise may have discarded. And when we discard them, it needs to be in an environment conscious manner. This video was compiled, narrated, and drawn by Swadha Rapa. My solution to coming out of the linear economy mindset would be to spread awareness of the concept of putting a ceiling on your desires. And these desires are time, money, and convenience. This concept would help people recognize their own mistakes. Without this concept, no one will be able to adopt any of the solutions we already have at hand, how many ever there are. This concept will motivate one to contribute positively to our environment. Those who still haven't taken the initiative on their own to change their ways and benefit the environment, they really need to be spoon-fed. So the best way to encourage the concept of ceiling on desires would be to physically demonstrate and make people actually create the easy solutions we already have, such as making t-shirt bags. This would help them realize how easy it is to put a ceiling on convenience, time and money. Thinking about chocolate, reinventing the packaging of Cadbury Dairy Milk Silk. People all over the world love chocolate. In fact, worldwide chocolate consumption is an estimated 7.2 million metric tons. But the packaging used on most popular chocolates isn't easily recyclable. It's called polypropylene and besides it, chocolate like the one in this photo often have aluminium foil and paper that further hamper recycling. So I considered a subscription model but chocolate is usually a compulsive buy, so I didn't think it would work. Instead, I'm proposing possible alternative materials for the three layers of packaging. Number one, aluminum foil is used to protect chocolate from moisture, odors, and leakage. It's also inexpensive. A possible alternative is beeswax paper, which fulfills the same functions, but is also reusable for up to a year and biodegradable. This is a look at beeswaxwraps.co.uk. But Primrose & Co. is a company in New Zealand that uses beeswax paper for wrapping its own chocolate. Beeswax paper isn't really used on a commercial scale yet but drop product price usually goes down on mass production. Number two, paper. Instead of plain old paper, there are two alternatives. One is plantable paper. This is a video from the Botanical Paperworks in the UK. In India, one sheet of plantable paper is 25 rupees or 0.30 euros. The second alternative is created by James Cropper UK. This paper incorporates thrown away cacao husks from chocolate production into food grade paper. This can save almost 3.5 million metric tons of cacao husks that would otherwise be discarded. 
Three, and perhaps the hardest to replace, is plastic. There are two possible alternatives to polypropylene. The first is agar bioplastic, which is extracted from red algae. M Margarita Talib has been working in Chile to produce different plastics from agar. Agar bioplastic can be dyed and has the potential to be stronger or more flexible depending on production processes. It is a perfect replacement for disposable single-use plastic and decomposes in two to four months. The second alternative is a bioplastic called polyhydroxyalkanates, or PHA, which can be a thermoplastic like polypropanol. PHA is biodegradable, but so far it's been difficult to find cheap carbon sources to commercially produce it. A new Tel Aviv University study has found a process to use microalgal biomass as a carbon source. Thanks to seaweed species called sea lettuce, PSA could become commercially usable. Thank you very much for listening to my project. This has been compiled and created by Swadha Rapat. As you may know, incredible amounts of foods go straight from the markets to landfills, piling up over the years. Fire tea solves a large portion of this unnecessary waste. Our paper tea filters are 100% biodegradable and compost friendly. Not only are our bags eco-friendly, but the actual flavorful and soothing tea is completely the green way. Every year, approximately 33 million tons of fruit and vegetables are wasted, including peels and edible but not appetizing fruits. Our tea will be made of these fruit and peels, preventing these perfectly edible components to be thrown away. We will dry up fruit, fruit peels and leaves and blend them together to make the tea. This mixture will then go into biodegradable tea bags, which we will sell. We will place bins around the city where people can drop off their used tea bags. The tea along with the tea bags will be used to, as compost to help grow leaves such as basil and mint, as well as fruit, which we will use to make the tea. This way, the business will be 100% circular and waste-free. So to be people to throw away the used tea in these specific bins. When they do so, they will receive a temporary discount, which can be used the next few times they buy tea. Right now, the tea market is great to invest in, as tea is the most popular hot drink in the UK, appealing to everybody from young to old. In addition, the global tea market was valued over 52 billion US dollars in 2018 and is expected to rise to over 81 billion dollars in 2026. Tea has a long history of popularity worldwide. Over recent years, the benefits of green teas and issues of food waste have both become even more apparent. An excellent way to help both your health and the environment is to purchase your tea bags from Viro Tea.
the linear economy is proven to be unsustainable. That's why we need to transition to a circular economy that's better for us and the planet. But how does one make this crucial transition? There are many industries that cause a lot of pollution and waste by following the archaic linear economy. An example is the ubiquitous pen. From offices to homes, they are everywhere. As a consequence, they also pollute a lot of places. In fact, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that enough pens are being disposed by the US yearly to cover the distance from the Earth to the Moon over 57 times. 1.6 billion pens from the US alone are ending up in landfills and polluting the environment. This is a problem that needs to be addressed. Currently, the best option for the environment is to buy refills for the pens while keeping the body. However, the old refills are still being thrown away, leading to a persistent problem. Since the lifespan of each pen is fairly predictable based on the person using it, we could view refilling a pen as a subscription. The way this model works is that a free pen is sent to prospective owners for sampling for a week. If the owner likes the pen and wants to continue using them, they can fill out a form of how many pens they need as well as other details like the ink thickness and color. The pens are then delivered to them. They can also gauge how often they use up a pen's ink and need to refill. Based on that, new refills for each of their pens can be delivered in exchange for old ones. The owner will also have the chance to change the intervals at which their refills are delivered weekly. So, what is done with all the used refills? Well, they can be remanufactured to supply new ones to other users. After the ink is removed from the tube, it is relatively easy to separate the refill into its components and reuse them. The process can be repeated monthly for new customers wishing to join and existing ones who want to exit the loop. Using and reusing these materials instead of having to mine them will certainly benefit the environment. Although new resources do have to be mined for new customers, this is certainly an improvement over the current model, an improvement that should be welcomed. Thank you.